Hello everyone, uh, thank you for your time today. I'm really excited to be here to tell you about quantum computing and what we're doing uh, in Toronto at Xanadu. Let me see. Just waiting for the slides to come up, one second. I told you they were after you. <laughs> All right, let's see if this works. Here we go. So i um, happy to tell you today about the future of quantum computing from the perspective of Xanadu, where um, a Toronto-based company, we're into our seventh year now, and our mission is to build quantum computers, make them useful and available to people everywhere. Uh, so far, we've uh, raised quite a lot of money. You need to do that for a quantum computing company. But more importantly, we have over 170 people now, and uh, based in downtown, downtown Toronto. And the key part of our mission statement um, is that it incorporates many aspects to it. So we're building the hardware, um, we're making it useful uh, by having uh, software, and we're making it available to people everywhere through Xanadu Cloud. And so based on that, we do many things, and they all come together to off offer quantum computing to people. So first off, we do integrated chip design. So think of maybe like a NVIDIA type company. Uh, so we're a fabulous company. So we actually design all the chips in-house and send them off to foundries around the world and get them back. Once we get them back, we do the chip packaging. So this is a, an important step to actually using the quantum computer and building it. And then on top of that, we have the software layer. The software is obviously a key part. And I'll talk about it more in a second. And it's our Penny Lane software stack. And obviously, the applications is the most important thing once you have all those things uh, lined up. Ultimately, you want to serve the customer and you want to solve a problem. And we do that through the application layer. I really like this slide because it actually shows uh, how many people are involved in building a quantum computer. It's not just um, you know, a couple of sets of skill sets are required, but we work with many different types of people around the world. So we've got the three main categories I mentioned before. We've got hardware, which we do. We also do the software and we have the application layer. And you can see some of the different companies. On the hardware side, we have people that helps us make the, the quantum computers themselves. So you think of foundries, uh, you think of people that make the, the chips, people that make uh, the components that uh, are formed as part of the quantum computer. And then on top of that, you have the software. So we're working with uh, sort of the gamut from very small startups in the quantum space, all the way up to the big companies like AWS, uh, Nvidia, Google, and IBM. And then finally, one of the key parts is actually what do you use a quantum computer for? And so we're focusing uh, mostly on the, on the car automobile sector. And the reason why is they are also focusing on quantum computing. So it's a good match. Uh, we've also worked with banks before and also DARPA and other government labs. So the key thing that really differentiates Xanadu is that we're building quantum, computing, quantum computers using light or photons. So we're a photonic-based quantum computing company. So in the first picture there, we were the first company anywhere in the world to have quantum qubits um, on, on the cloud. And we had our first eight qubit device. Qubits, you can think of that as one of the key metrics on how powerful a quantum computer is. And so it was pretty cool. And then a couple of years later, the team extended that. And we have the most powerful quantum computer on the cloud, uh, 216 light qubits. So these are our photonic-based qubits. And uh, this was actually published in Nature, and it demonstrated quantum computational advantage or quantum supremacy. It was the first time quantum supremacy was demonstrated in Canada, and uh, the first time by a startup. So the team was really proud about that. And this quantum computer that demonstrated quantum supremacy, we called it Borealis. And what we did, quantum supremacy essentially, you choose a very specific problem, and you go head to head with a supercomputer. And so what we did is we chose the world's fastest supercomputer. So it's not quantum, it's all classical. Uh, it's based in Japan. And we said, let's go head to head against Borealis. We did that. And what was incredible is it would have taken the world's fastest supercomputer 7 million years to solve this esoteric math problem. Uh, for Borealis, it took two minutes to do the same problem. It would have taken 7 million years. The energy savings, the number of cores, and all the infrastructure is just uh, remarkable as well. Now, the key point here, it doesn't solve any business applications, but that doesn't matter where we are currently. You want to show these big improvements exist in principle, and you use a lot of the, the hardware developments that we uh, actually achieve for Borealis 
in order to solve customer problems, which is a couple of years away. So why use photonics? Well, photonics um, is, you know, there's a number of benefits, and typically the other approach is use electronics, and we use quantum photonics, but there's a number of reasons why. So no cooling is required for the computational part of it, and, and I'd say approximately 70% of the computer overall doesn't need any cooling. We can actually use for manufacturing all the silicon-based processes that are well used and well documented in, in the foundries that exist today. Uh, it's also compatible with telecom. We didn't have to invent a laser or fiber optic, so we save a lot of time and money there. Faster clock speeds, error correction flexibility are really key to actually getting to a solid uh, quantum computer that has very little or manageable noise. And it's also modular. So our, our position is to build a quantum data center one day, and you actually have a number of these server racks, say hundreds or thousands of them, that have smaller quantum computers in them, but they network together or talk together using light. And what better way to do that if you're already using a light-based approach? So this is about the future of quantum computing, and even if you took Xanadu out of it, um, all quantum computing companies are after fault tolerance, an error correction. Basically what that means is they need to work the way you want them to work. And so you need to have this robustness or error correction ability into it. Our current chips that we have in our phones, they work so well. The errors are like once every, you know, millions of years. It's not like that for quantum because these systems are so different and so challenging to build that you need to make sure that they're actually error correctable and fault tolerant, tolerant to, to noise and faults. And so there's three phases to this. As I mentioned, you have the components you want to master. Then you have the, the networking ability. Once you've mastered one, you want to build many of these. And then you build them and put them all together in a data center. So uh, a lot of us in the industry and hardware companies were after a million qubits. So we're at 216 now in Xanadu. But the way you get there is by this networking approach. So you master one single server rack, and then you raise a lot of money, cut and paste, and then build more of them and they all talk to each, uh, to each other using light-based approach. So that's our quantum data center, and that's uh, essentially equivalent to fault tolerance, which is equivalent to solving customer problems. Now, if we go to the, the next slide, I just talked about the hardware. Remember, Xanadu is full stack, so we look at the hardware side, which I just discussed, and we also work on software. Our software is called Penny Lane. It's a great name, if I do say so myself. And... Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the, the most widely used software platforms out there or programming languages out there. And so it is first, actually, when you look at how, integrated, into, um, how it's been integrated with other hardware platforms. So it's maybe a little unusual. Our software obviously runs on our hardware, but we've said, look, we love Penny Lane. The team loves it. Um, why don't we make it available to every other hardware platform out there? So it's available on more ha other hardware platform providers than anywhere else in the world. It's all Canadian as well. And we've had our Penny Lane developer conference, which we called QHack. Um, and over the last two or three years, we've had over 8,000 participants, which is quite incredible. Uh, we're also trying to shore up um, Penny Lane in the uh, university ecosystem. So Penny Lane is actually an important part of the curriculum when uh, quantum information and quantum computing is being taught in universities. So we have 40 universities around the world using uh, Penny Lane. We're hoping to get to 100 in the next couple of years. And you can see that we're very much fixated initially on Canada and shoring up the Canadian ecosystem and universities in terms of them using Penny Lane. Now, so we have the hardware, the software. What does all this come around to? It comes to, to solving important customer problems. So since our beginning, we've been looking at doing a number of uh, business use cases. And we are one of the pioneers in terms of that. So you can see on this, uh, this slide here, we industry applications. We started with banking. And the last two, three years, we've been solely focused on next generation battery development. So the bigger picture there or the vertical would be uh, quantum chemistry or material design. But we're focusing specifically on, on next generation battery. Um, that goes hand in hand with Penny Lane. Think of Penny Lane as the software that you want to use these computers, and the software is really an access point for companies to use to solve their problems. So Penny Lane goes hand in hand with these, uh, with these developments, uh, industry use cases. You can see DARPA, AWS, NVIDIA, uh, and other high-performance computing centers as well using uh, Penny Lane. So I'll end up here just talking about um, the final part, next generation battery design. Um, we've chosen that because 
the main areas that you often hear about in quantum computing would be logistics, in terms of you know, industry problems that can be solved. We've got logistics, we've got pharma and drug discovery, uh, we have material design that I mentioned, and also finance. So quantum computing can't solve every single problem you know, much, much faster, like we saw the, the quantum supremacy demonstration. But there's certain verticals or industries that it can make huge dents in and will be really vital. One of our theses uh, for quantum computing and Xanadu in general is you look back in, in uh, 100 years time at the end of this century and you'll think, where would we have been without quantum computing in terms of drug discovery, in terms of material design and new products? Uh, you know, analogy there would be in terms of uh, uh, our computers. You know, since the 50s or so, uh, in the 70s and 80s and beyond, we've had the internet, we've had chips, we've had PCs and mobiles. Imagine if that was eradicated from our lives, what our lives would be like. So we look at this sort of technology and computers as being proportional to innovation, and that's how we see it. So it's vital that we have this hardware, software, and application layer. One way to perhaps think about it is we're kind of like the quantum version of AWS or Azure or the cloud computing. And so out of those different verticals, we've chosen uh, next generation battery development for a few reasons. One is that the, the hardware seems ideal for that sort of uh, problem, and the mathematics seems to be one of the key aspects that align with those types of problems. Remember, it doesn't solve every problem exponentially faster. Also, um, we see electric vehicle companies are exploding in the last few years, and we indicate, uh, we believe this will also continue this decade. Sustainability is a big issue, and you also want to wake up each day and work on something incredible like quantum computing, but have something that can be impactful and feel like you're actually doing something good and making a difference. Uh, you read the news the last few years, everything seems to be pessimistic, and so we hope quantum computing and also this particular use case uh, will give us a lot of hope and motivation. And that's one of the key aspects of, of Xanadu. So I'll finish up here. Um, the electric vehicle side of thing is, is key for those reasons. And what we're looking at is uh, with Volkswagen and Rolls-Royce and all the major car companies is how can, it, if you had a million qubits today and these car companies had access to it, where would it actually fit? You know, one of the interesting things is even if we had a million qubits today and, you know, car companies could access it over the cloud, they would not know what to do with it. Imagine that. You've got this new technology that we think we're all familiar with. NVIDIA comes out with a new chip. Intel comes out with a new chip. You essentially just put it back in the computer and you know what's going to happen. You can do more work or you can do things much faster and things are speedier. It's not like that with quantum computing. If you have a new quantum chip, you have no idea how it can actually um, work with your problems. So it takes a lot of time. In some sense, it's good that the hardware is still catching up because we need to understand exactly where it can connect. So it's a very exciting time. We're happy to work with our partners. And uh, we're only getting started with quantum computing. And we're really proud that we can also do this in, uh, in Toronto and Canada in general. So thank you very much. Uh, and please let me know if you have any questions and contact me. I'll be happy to sort of tell you more. Thank you.